Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1977 Giallo film, The Psychic. It's a Lucio Fulci film, and it's a Fulci film I had not seen before. So this is gonna be available just on my channel in general. It's also gonna be available in the Giallo and Giallo-inspired film playlist, or I think it's Giallo and Giallo-esque playlist. And the Lucio Fulci playlist, because I have one of those. So you can check those out as well. Uh, I, I will say off the bat, I like this one. This is one of the better Giallo films I've seen in the past bunch of months, honestly. Uh, and actually, I might be stepping back a little bit, or actually putting it aside for some time, doing Giallo uh, and Italian film reviews. But uh, we'll see. Uh, if I'm going to do that, I'll make like a full-on announcement like, with like a channel update. But look for that if, if that happens. Anyway, directed by Lucio Fulci, uh, and this was after Don't Torture a Duckling, but before the film Zombie. So this is actually a very interesting part of his life. This was, oh, and by the way, I watched it on the Blu-ray that I own, which, look at that amazing H.R. Giger artwork on it. Pretty awesome, let's be honest. Pretty awesome. Love it. Um, so this was during a very interesting time period filmmaker wise for Lucio Fulci because the psychic basically marked the last, like, I'm trying to think about the best way to say this. I'll just say it. the last intelligent, uh, horror film that he made, uh, he, he did a bunch of Giallo things, like obviously don't torture a duckling and the psychic and stuff like that. And then he made a shift, which started with his film Zombie, where he decided that he wanted to go more for visuals and less for story. So this was basically the end, right before Zombie took over, and then that became his style kind of going forward. Although I believe, that, I think the New York Ripper was after, though, which was kind of maybe a return. I'd have to check on that, but... Uh, written by Fulci, as well as Roberto Gianviti, who also worked on scripts for Terror of the Red Mask, Corpse for the Lady, One on Top of the Other, The Conspiracy of Torture, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, also a Fulci giallo that is quite good, uh, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, also a giallo, uh, Don't Torture a Duckling, also a Fulci giallo, Five Women for the Killer, and Don't Touch the Children. Also, Dardano Sacchetti was involved in this, which, if you don't know that name and you know Giallo, then shame on you, because Sacchetti was involved in a bunch. Um, he did other films such as Demons, Demons 2, 1990, The Bronx Warriors, The Scorpion with Two Tails, A Bay of Blood, Cat of Nine Tails, and The New York Ripper. Every one of those Giallo films that I just named that these other people have worked on script-wise, I have reviews for on my channel, because I've done a lot at this point. So this film had a bunch of different titles, including Seven Notes in Black, Death Tolls Seven Times, and Murder to the Tune of the Seven Black Notes. Now, Murder to the Tune of the Seven Black Notes is what is the title card for this Blu-ray version. So it's kind of weird that they put it out as the psychic when it comes up with a different title for the actual title card. I always find that to be kind of a weird thing, but it is what it is. So apparently, Ernesto Gastaldi actually wrote the initial script outline for this film, but the producers actually didn't receive it well. They didn't really like what he had done. So that's when Fulci and Gianviti, who had worked together before, came on, and um, they presented a, a script to the producers that they, at that point, liked more than what Gastaldi did, but they weren't quite there. They weren't fully happy. So then they asked to have Dardano Sacchetti get involved, and then Sacchetti came in and kind of took a pass at it. And then that's how you came up with the final script that you have here, which is a pretty good script, I will say. It turned into a, a pretty solid flick. Now, with a lot of these films, what ends up becoming another important thing, other than like the, the actual directing, cinematography, acting, the score. So Fabio Frizi did the score for this, which was not a big surprise to me that it was good because I didn't look at who had done the score before I started watching the film and immediately I was like, I love this music. I have to look and see who did it and there you go. I, I saw the name Fabio Frizi and I'm like, okay, this makes sense why I think it's so good. Frizi did a great job. Uh, Frizi's done scores for other films such as, but he's done a lot, uh, Godzilla, Zombie, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, Pieces, The Scorpion with Two Tails, and A Cat in the Brain. So collaborated with Fulci quite a decent amount. 
Um, he was one of the people who did the music. There were three other individuals involved, but obviously Freezy was the biggest name. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful score for this for this film, and I think it really helps drive the film at many points. Apparently, Quentin Tarantino had said that he wanted to do a remake of this film at some point, but then obviously that never really materialized. But he did then use some of the music from the psychic in, I believe it was the first installment of his Kill Bill. Uh, I was gonna say tr I was like, it's not a trilogy, duality, duo. Yeah, the Kill Bill films. Let me just put it that way. Okay, so let's get into the actual events of the film. The mother falling off the cliff and you seeing her face scrape all these rocks as she's falling down that cliff, it is gnarly. That is the type of start that I expect from someone like Lucio Fulci, who gave us the wonderful start to the New York Ripper where it's just a freeze frame for the opening credits on a severed, decaying hand in a dog's mouth. Like, that is the type of stuff that Fulci does, and that's what I look forward to with him. So, out of the gate, just not disappointing. Now, I will say that after that, it kind of gets a pretty tame for a while in the film, but what a blast. What a great way to just kind of start things off. The, forebo the foreboding music that plays as Virginia drives through tunnels seems like maybe it's insinuating death. And hear me out, just because of the whole thing of seeing light at the end of the tunnel thing, and they're literally setting those types of shots up where she's going in and she's like seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, I believe that could be a little bit of a hint that the vision she ends up having while she's going through these tunnels are her demise. So it's just kind of the subtle hint to viewers that they probably don't pick up on the very first time they watch it, that that she's seeing the light at the end of the tunnel when she's seeing this vision. So she doesn't know it at that point. She actually thinks it, well, ends up thinking it's a vision of a crime that already happened, but truly she is seeing her potential demise. Now there obviously is a question at the very end of the film, whether she actually dies or not, you would be led to lean towards no, because it looks like Luca actually saves her by recognizing the sound of her watch, but yeah, but they just kind of stop it, so you don't know for sure. Um, you get the idea Virginia's vision is probably correct due to the film set up with her as a child sensing her mother was committing suicide. Um, oh, also, real quick, I did need to say that the, those visions when she was going through the tunnel, very well pieced together, very cool. And I love how as the portions of what she saw in her visions become present in the right in the rest of the film you keep thinking back to that vision and just kind of like ticking them off and being like yep mm -hmm, that was in the vision that was in the vision so like the way they crafted that together took a lot of time took a lot of attention to detail and it was really well done in my opinion it's also just very engaging the way it played out so anyway uh but going back to the whole thing with virginia as a child when she was sensing that her mother was about to commit suicide that's a great way to set everything up to let the audience know this is legit. You know, to not really question her as some characters do within the film. And, you know, rightfully so, because in a real life situation, who's going to be like, oh, you believe you're a clairvoyant and you have seen, you know, this crime? I mean, it's not that believable. So you understand why the characters don't believe. But with the setup they, they presented, it helps the audience realize that She's a real deal. And Virginia begins to see the Palazzo room as a room of death, as many things in it are from her vision. I like that they get started kind of early on that. And obviously it was a really cool kind of red herring where the design of that room looked like what was in her vision, but her vision was actually showing another room, which is pretty crazy in my opinion, that, that just kind of like had some of the same accoutrement in their furniture and all that. So that was that was a cool setup. I, I kind of like that red herring. Because normally when you're thinking red herrings in films like this, especially Giallo, um, it's, it's like a person. It's like the red herring of who the killer is. And obviously there's some of that in this. But um, when it's then like a setting red herring, that's kind of new for me. And I really like that twist. I wish more, more films would try and do stuff like that. I love how she wastes very little time busting the wall open with a pickaxe because obviously she's got to get to the bottom of this because she recognizes it as being from her vision. So she just goes in like 
all in just busting this wall down. Now, obviously, it was a good idea because then the remains of the 20-something-year-old model are found, which I, I still don't really understand, like, why she was modeling with a horse. It was like an equestrian magazine, I guess, or something. I don't know, kind of weird. Was she modeling the horse? Was the horse the main point? Anyway. Francesco, Francesco does seem like a strong initial suspect since the groundskeeper said Francesco acts strangely and it is his house. Remember that those words were spoken by the groundskeeper. And the suspicion grows when you find out that the dead girl was in a relationship with Francisco. But at the same time, you kind of like, well, why would he admit this, though? You know, and, and obviously by the end, you just find out that he's so sure that he'll be able to get himself out of this, that he's smarter than everyone else, that everything will basically pan out for him, that he's just so brazen that he just throws this information out there. Or he just suspected that that information was going to end up coming to light anyway. I mean, it is a dead body being found in the house that he owns, and that's public record, so everyone knows that. So at the least, he would be a very strong suspect. Now, I am surprised that he ended up being the actual killer, because usually in Giallo films, they put, set up a ton of red herring individuals early on, and then it's never someone who's considered by the end. Well, almost never. I like that they bucked that trend in this film, because you're if you watch enough Giallo, you're so in the mindset of, okay, they're strongly leaning on this guy, it's not going to be him, because they strongly lean on him, and then they go and give you other ideas of other people, which you start seeing as more viable than Francesco as the actual killer. So I like that. For the audience, the reveal of Gloria having changed the furniture in the room after Francesco went to America rules him out, although later on he's ruled back in, obviously, but that does become a hard sell for the police, and rightfully so, because it's being predicated on furniture. <laughs> you know, this is another thing where Virginia's like, you know, the furniture I saw in my vision. Like, just talking about, like, stuff you saw in your vision is kind of crazy enough to the police. But then talking about the furniture in your vision and that being, like, a linchpin to someone's innocence is also kind of nuts, in my opinion. <laughs> Emilio doesn't do himself any favors by the way he acts when he first sees Virginia. Uh, he gets super cagey immediately. That's when she kind of poses as a uh, newspaper reporter. And it's like, oh, I want to talk to him about, you know, equestrian stuff. Uh, and obviously she doesn't. She suspects him as a potential killer. And like I said, he doesn't do himself any favors. He acts super, super suspicious. But... That's something that they do in Giallo a lot to just help cast suspicion on people who end up being red herrings. So a lot of the times people act suspicious when it doesn't necessarily make sense, and I think Emilio fits into that category. The inspector doesn't seem too eager to follow up on Virginia's evidence to clear Francesco. Now, in retrospect, it would probably be better if he was even less so into that because it ends up being Francesco who is the bad guy who uh, killed the 20-something and is trying to kill another 20-something in Virginia. Luca does cast doubt on Virginia's perspective when he puts out that the magazine, when he puts it out, points out that the magazine that she says she saw in her vision wouldn't have been released at that point. But Luca seems convinced that she saw the future and not the past. This was a cool kind of reversal, like twist, within the film where the audience at this point is probably pretty convinced as Virginia is that the vision that she saw is from the past because that body is found because the room the body's found in looks like in her vision. But then when Luca kind of says, well, no, this magazine wouldn't have been published at this point to be in your vision from the past. I think this is a vision of events to come. It kind of flips the whole film on its head, at least the whole story, it really flips on its head. And you start to look at things in a very different way. And then it creates, like immediately when this idea comes up, it creates this extra level of, I guess, danger and um, intrigue and mystery. Because at that point, you're like, well, then someone else is going to die. At least one other person is going to die, and who's it going to be? And then as you start to realize that this was kind of Virginia seeing her own potential demise, then you start to feel progressively more and more concerned for her character, 
which works really well within the context of the film and really helps to, you know, get the audience more emotionally wrapped up in what's happening. The shift in thinking of the vision as future creates an increased sense of danger and tension in the film, like I said. Uh, the way the house Virginia goes to is lit looks cool as she walks through it. That's that old farmhouse that they stay at for quite some time, I will say. But the lighting, really well done within this. Uh, another aspect of the lighting that I really liked was that red lampshade that they used in a few instances. And people would get close to it and would like cast red light on like half the face or like on the front of the face to Francesco at towards the end of the film. Uh, I really like that stuff. And I think that... At least at the end with Francesco, I think it was uh, geared towards showing his kind of, like, evil side. That, like, once it's revealed that he's going to be Virginia's killer and he did kill that 20-something model, that um, it's showing, like, evil in the form of red, like the devil. And the pieces of the vision t uh, come together when she finds the lady in the house dead and Emilio coming down the stairs portions of her vision. Now, the interesting thing about her vision and what, what becomes misleading for her and misleading for the audience is that her vision was basically not one event necessarily. It was a bunch of things placed together. It was like fragments of things that she would end up doing in places she was would end up going kind of just mashed together, which is why it ended up being so hard to figure out. But that's also why it has so much impact and so much of an interesting reveal once all those things are kind of unpacked. And then by the end, you understand how all those things went together in that one vision. So I really like that. It's a bit long of a scene when Virginia's sneaking around as Emilio is searching for her, but they do maintain tension relatively well, and I think that this is where the music really helps. You know, I had said earlier the music was a big part of this film, and I think that part in particular, it helps keep the film from getting too boring. Because let's be honest, that whole sequence is is probably longer than it really needs to be by 10 minutes, maybe? Let's be honest. Kind of lame that... Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, it's kind of lame that Emilio gets taken down by a wooden plank that ends up breaking under his weight when he's following after Virginia. Decent enough setup, though, for the jolt back to life when he grabs Virginia it just seemed really weak at first when he falls and you're like, oh, is, this, is he dead now? Because you see the pool of blood from his head as he's laying on the ground and Virginia's looking down from above. But it just seemed like such a quick, like, lame thing. Like, it should have been something where, like, I don't know, she grabs something and fights against him and, like, hits him in the head. But then again, I guess maybe they didn't want the character of Virginia to do that because then she hurt someone who actually was not the killer. So I guess maybe having it be more of like an accident was a better way to go, but it just seemed kind of lame. But the jump scare, like him, you know, coming alive or coming back, coming around and grabbing her was, was cool. But then again, like it's such a suspicious thing for him to be doing. Also, just like going after her is yet another suspicious thing. I don't know. At that point, did he think that she had killed the old lady? I don't, I don't know. Francesco showing up at the farmhouse limping makes it look like bad news for Virginia, and I guarantee pretty much every audience member was thinking that when they saw that part of the film. As soon as you see that limp, you're like, oh no, she's in trouble. Francesco's alibi gets eliminated when the horse trainer remembers he killed the horse on the magazine a year earlier. So that is... Another one of these ah type moments. But I think the limp is kind of more important to the audience than that moment. I don't, I don't even really think they needed the horse trainer saying that. Because we got it with the whole limp thing. And then all the, all the things that Virginia recognizes within that room later. Yeah. Um, they do a good job building the dread as Virginia sees all the signs that her vision was for her own death. And that is a really cool realization for her and for the audience at the same time. Like, that greatly increases the tension, increases the dread, the sense of danger, is that all along she was trying to solve a murder, but really she needed to solve her own future murder. It, it's a cool concept. I like Luca's method to get the cops to the farmhouse. Just lead them on a high-speed chase. Um... 
it was smart just because he kind of really didn't have time to waste in that sense. But at the same time, it's funny when you're watching, you're just like, oh, this is, this is how he's going to get the help of the police. Okay. It is a cool moment when Luca looks around and pieces everything together from Virginia's description of her vision. This is why it was really important to have a character like Luca in the film. Because initially I was like, why is he all that important? She's just going to talk to him like it's her therapist, basically. But it ends up being severely important that she told him the details of her vision because then he remembers it as he's in this room as Francesco is trying to get rid of him and the police. And he can look around and be suspicious enough and be like, mm, I remember this from her vision. I remember this from her vision. So he knows that something is amiss. Although he is basically going to leave at some point during it because the police are kind of pushing him that way. Until the watch. Um, at the, the watch that Gloria gave Virginia ends up being what busts Francesco in the end. Who thought that? Who saw that coming? Probably nobody. I, I certainly didn't. I... At that point, I'd even forgotten about the watch, but they do make a big point of showing the watch when it's presented, which in retro retrospect, it makes sense that it ended up having such a big role because they really focused on that watch. I just hadn't really... It slipped by me. I feel like the music drives the pacing quite a bit because of how upbeat it is in this film. Once again, Freezy and others did an excellent job with the score. There are a good deal of shots from above that utilize architecture to construct interesting shots within the film. This is one of the things I like about these really well-directed, uh, really awesome cinematography films, especially giallo films from this time period. Well, and just like Italian film from this time period. Architecture was used in a very interesting way, and a lot of times it just like frames shots in such a beautiful, interesting way. And there are a bunch of those shots done in this film. Uh, probably the one that comes to mind most within this was the one where some people were going down like the spiral staircase and the Fulci just like shot it like straight down and just like the shapes in there look so, so cool. But architecture making a great uh, appearance in this film. The clues to the crime are revealed at a pretty good pace within this film, which actually keeps you engaged even though things sometimes get a little bit slow, pacing gets a little bit crappy. Uh, but not too terrible. But um, yeah, the fact that they kind of like spaced out the little bits of the vision enough really keeps you engaged. I mean, the film's like, I think it was like an hour and 37 minutes with credits. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like it goes relatively quick. So yeah. But that's all I have to say about The Psychic. Obviously, I enjoyed this one. It's not in my top 10 Giallo films, but I think it might be in my top 20. And I've seen a lot of Giallo films at this point. Out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give this a very nice three and a half star rating. Thought about going four, but no, I think it's more at the three range. But just know I, I really did consider the four. And maybe on another day I would I would go to four, but three and a half at this point. Would love to hear your opinions on this film. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Love it, hate it, in between, and just give me a little explanation as to why. Like a sentence or two is totally fine. Uh, do me a quick favor, hit subscribe if you haven't already. That is your way to repay me if you like this video or any video I've ever done. It is quick. It is painless. It costs you no money, and I appreciate it. Literally keeps me motivated, so I'd appreciate that. Also, hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos, which I'm doing for a week at this point, which I think is a good amount. Regardless, I thank you very much for taking your time to watch this video, and until next time, keep it brutal.